The occasion of our conference today and tomorrow and in subsequent weeks is the 400th anniversary in this, the year of our Lord, 2019, of the composing and adoption of one of the great creeds of the Christian Church. This is a creed that ranks in importance with that of Nicaea, the Athanasian Creed, the symbol of Chalcedon, and the Westminster Confession of Faith. It is one of a handful of the truly important creeds of the Christian Church down the ages. The creed to which I refer is the canons of the Synod of Dort. Dort, in this name, is the name of the creed because the synod that drew up and adopted this creed met in the city of Dort in the nation that today we know as the Netherlands. The church assembly, the synod that adopted these canons met from November 1618 to the end of May 1619. The synod adopted the canons early in 1619 in fact, in April of 1619, almost to the day 400 years ago that we are meeting today. Hence this anniversary year in celebration of the adoption of the canons. This confession or creed comes to have the title canons because the word canon in the Latin language means decision or doctrine with emphasis on the authority of the doctrine. The Canons of Dort, therefore, is the authoritative doctrine that was formulated and adopted by the Reformed Church in the Netherlands in April of 1619. The tremendous significance of this Canons is that it is the creed of virtually all Reformed churches worldwide. As the creed of all Reformed churches worldwide, this document expresses the one faith and guards the unity of a Reformed congregation, as, for example, the Covenant Protestant Reformed Church of Northern Ireland. As a creed, the canons expresses the faith and promotes the unity of Reformed denominations of churches all over the world in North America, in Europe, in South Africa, in the Philippines, and elsewhere. As the creed of virtually all Reformed churches, the canons is the foundation of the genuine ecumenicity of Reformed churches wherever this ecumenicity flourishes. The unity of Reformed churches worldwide is expressed by and guided by and governed by this document known as the Canons of the Synod of Dort. I open up our conference today celebrating the creation of the Canons, calling attention to, quote, the onset of the Great War, end of quote, because the Church Assembly that adopted these Canons met and conducted its meetings in the atmosphere of war. This war was mostly ecclesiastical, but to some extent was also political. The Synod held its meetings only by way of political struggle in the nation of the Netherlands and in the nations of Europe as a whole. Such was the political turmoil surrounding the Synod that the Roman Catholic King of France refused to allow men who had been delegated to this church meeting by the Reformed Church in France to attend the Synod. There ought to have been delegates from France at this Synod, but the King refused to allow them to attend. And in the famous painting or drawing of the interior of the church where the Synod met, The absence of the French delegates is indicated by four empty chairs. Throughout the Synod, four chairs around the table at which the Synod met were left empty, signifying 
that the French delegation ought to have been there and to have filled those chairs. The great ecclesiastical war that produced and was fought by the canons was mainly ecclesiastical and doctrinal. Nations fight, but the Church of Christ in the world fights as well. And at that time, the Reformed Church was engaged in the greatest war of all, the war of the gospel against the forces of the kingdom of Satan. By the adoption of these canons, the false church was routed and the true church of Jesus Christ triumphed. There is something fitting, therefore, about the name of the creed, the anniversary of which we remember this year. In the vernacular, canons, with two M's, is the name of big guns used in big earthly warfare. The Canons of Dort is the biggest spiritual weapon of the warfare in the biggest war that a church is engaged in. Canons, therefore, of Dort. In this opening address, I will set the stage for the explanation of the Canons itself in the two speeches that are to follow. I will explain the Canons themselves in the following two lectures. And this morning I'm going to speak on the setting of the canon, talking about the events that led up to the meeting of the Synod and the adoption of the canons. I want to consider with you this morning in the first lecture the church historical and doctrinal struggles that led up to the Synod and its canons. I had toyed originally with the notion to title this first speech at our conference, The Gathering Storm. But since Winston Churchill has already seized this expressive, expressive phrase as the title of his book setting forth the developments that led up to World War II, regretfully I abandoned this title for the onset of the Great War. It is always wise to defer to Sir Winston Churchill. What I will do then in this first lecture is to set the stage for the Synod and its canons. Two main realities stand out in this connection. Certain ecclesiastical happenings in the Dutch church and certain doctrinal developments. Let us begin with the developments in the Dutch church the historical background of the meeting of the Synod of Dort. Three important truths about the Dutch church in the Netherlands in the days leading up to the controversy resulting in the adoption of the canons of Dort must be kept in mind. First, the church that called itself Reformed had just emerged from the Roman Catholic Church. It therefore contained many ministers who were still Roman Catholic in their beliefs and in their teachings. The Reformation, as you know, began in Germany about the year 1517. The Reform branch of the Reformation took hold in the Netherlands about the middle 1550s, only about 60 years prior to the Synod of Dort. Many ministers in the Reformed churches in the Netherlands were former Roman Catholic priests. They had changed churches, but they had not changed their beliefs and doctrine. Some of them rejected the evil practices of the Roman church, but not the doctrines of the Roman Catholic church. Such was the case with a prominent Arminian minister and theologian named Cornhert. Calvin called him, quote, that drunken Dutchman, end of quote. And I can only hope that Calvin did not mean to imply that Dutchmen are commonly drunkards. This explains why many ministers in the Reformed Church in the Netherlands at that time were attracted to Arminianism. They were priests who had left the Roman Catholic Church but had not abandoned Roman Catholic doctrines. 
Basically, Arminianism is the false gospel of salvation by the free will of the sinner. And as we will see later, the false gospel of justification by works. And this is the fundamental doctrine also of the Roman Catholic Church, as Luther had demonstrated in his great book, The Bondage of the Will. The Reformed Church in the Netherlands at this time had begun to be reformed, but Reformation was not yet completed. By the great struggle with the Arminian heresy, God continued and in a way completed the Reformation of the Church in the Netherlands. Because the Synod of Dort was ecumenical, a meeting of the Church worldwide at that time Dort represented the reformation of the church worldwide. The second truth about the reformed church in the Netherlands at the time of the Synod of Dort that was worth our noting is that the shrewd Arminians were able at that time to create a theology that actually denied salvation by grace while putting up the appearance of being in agreement with the gospel of salvation by grace. The Reformed Church at that time had only two creeds, the Heidelberg Catechism and the Belgic Confession, and both of them were very brief in expressing and defending the truth of predestination, the core of the gospel of salvation by grace alone. The canons of Dort were necessary in order fully and clearly to confess salvation by grace while also opposing and condemning all doctrines that corrupted and compromised the gospel of grace. This is the glorious distinction of the canons of Dort the confession drawn up and adopted at the Synod of Dort. It expressed, confessed, and defended salvation by the grace of God and by the grace of God alone. Here is its place in the short list of the great confessions of the Christian Church in the time of the New Testament. The Nicene Creed defended the truth of the Godhead of Jesus Christ. Chalcedon defended the truth of the two natures of Jesus Christ. The Athanasian Creed defended the truth of the Trinity. Dort was the first and basic defense of the gospel of salvation by grace and by grace alone, rejecting the heresy of salvation by the will and the works of the sinner. Another truth about the Dutch church at the time of Dort that sheds light on the calling of the synod that drew up and adopted the Dort Confession is that there was a close relation at that time between the Dutch state and the Reformed church. There was a close relation between the ecclesiastical rulers and the political rulers of the Netherlands at that time. The relation between the Dutch state and the Dutch church can fairly be called Erastian, after a theologian named Erastus, who taught that the political state ought to govern the church. In the middle and late 1550s, what we now know as the Netherlands was a number of only loosely related provinces we would call them states. And each of those provinces had its own political ruler. There was a political struggle at that time, sometimes resulting in earthly wars between the independent provinces and the representatives of the union of the provinces as a nation, one nation. That was similar to the struggle in the United States that led to the Civil War in the 1800s. That Civil War, among other things, was a contest 
between states' rights, the right of each state to govern itself, and the rule of all the states by a national government. Something like that was taking place in the Netherlands at the time of the Synod of Dort. The advocate of the Netherlands as one nation was Prince Moritz. He was the son of William the Silent, the great man who had freed the Netherlands from the tyranny of Spain and of the Roman Catholic Church. Moritz advocated the union of the states in one national government. The advocate of the independency of the various provinces was the extremely influential figure, Jan Olden Barnevelt. This political struggle explains why politics was involved in the church struggle at that time. Olden Barnevelt and the other advocates of the independency of the provinces did not want a national synod. And therefore, they were opposed to the adoption of a creed that would be binding upon all of the provinces in the Netherlands and would have the effect of uniting all of the provinces as one nation. These political advocates of the independency of the states, including especially Olden Barnevelt, were Arminian in their theology. And that was another reason why they were opposed to the calling of a national synod. They feared that that synod would condemn Arminianism, which it did, and express Reformed orthodoxy as the truth to be held by the Reformed churches, which it did. Moritz and his supporters wanted a national synod that would unite all of the states under the government of Moritz. And it would at the same time affirm Calvinism and reject Arminian theology. All of those involved at the time of the Synod of Dort were laboring and fighting in the conviction, quote, one religion, one nation. Some were opposed to that, others ap approved of that, but all of them fought in the conviction that if there was a synod held, binding upon all of the states of the Netherlands, the result would be one nation. The fact is that Dort, in addition to its influence upon the churches, also had a powerful cultural and social influence in unifying the nation of the Netherlands. Now into that ecclesiastical situation stepped Jacob, or James Arminius, a minister and a theologian. Arminius was a learned, well-spoken, and very shrewd minister in the large, influential Reformed Church in Amsterdam, the most prominent and powerful city in all of the Netherlands at that time, as it still is, I would guess, today. Arminius occupied an influential and important pulpit, not only in the province of Holland, one of the provinces of the Netherlands at that time, <coughs> but also with regard to all of the Netherlands. And because of the Europe-wide reputation of the Netherlands, Arminius occupied an important, powerful pulpit with regard to all of Europe, the civilized world of that day. The goings-on that we commemorate at this conference were not only limited in its influence, their influence, and importance to the Netherlands, but had importance and influence for all of Europe at that time. It is remarkable throughout the history of the church, keeping in mind that Arminius occupied this prestigious pulpit, it is remarkable throughout the history of the church how Satan sees to it that his men occupy strategic positions in the visible church. Satan has a way of seeing to it that heretical ministers and theologians occupy prestigious and influential positions in the church. That was certainly true of Arminius. 
Amsterdam, where Arminius had his pulpit and church, was already then the most prominent and influential city in all of the Netherlands. Adding to Arminius' influence was his close friends and powerful allies in the church and state. I have already mentioned the politician Olden Barneveld. He was a very powerful politician throughout all of the Netherlands. He held tremendous sway over all of the Netherlands at that time, and he was Arminian in his theology. There was another extremely important figure promoting the Arminian cause at that time, a churchman and theologian by the name of Eiten Bogart. He was a kind of national preacher in all of the Netherlands, similar to the influence that Billy Graham had in the United States in recent times. Arminius first showed his heretical colors in a series of sermons on Romans 7. Take note of that. Not Romans 9, where the doctrine of predestination is prominent, but in a series of sermons on Romans 7. Romans 7 is the chapter in Romans in which the Apostle Paul says, The good that I would, I do not, and the evil that I would not, that I do. In that text and the context, Paul expresses that he has a will to do the good and that he has a will not to do the evil. He has, therefore, as he speaks in Romans 7, a good will. Since this person claims to will the good, Arminius taught that this person, speaking in Romans 7, is an unregenerated, unbelieving, unsaved person. And that implies that the unsaved, natural, sinful man has a free will, which was the heart then and is still today the heart of Arminian theology. Be clear about that. Arminius explained Romans 7 as the personal, experiential, stand and condition of an unregenerated, unsaved man. That means that unsaved persons have a will to do the good and a will not to do the evil. The implication of Arminius' explanation is the free will of the natural, unsaved man. And now salvation, Arminius taught, depends not on the mighty, regenerating, saving grace of God, but upon the choice or decision of the sinner by a will that is not in bondage to sin, but that is free to choose the good. Free will is the fundamental error of Arminius, and free will is the fundamental error of Arminius' disciples today. All of salvation beginning with God's eternal election, depends, according to Arminius and Arminianism, upon man's choice of Christ by his will that is free to make that choice. All of salvation, according to Arminius, beginning with election, is conditional, the condition being the right choice of man's free will. According to Arminius, and Arminianism today, man saves himself by making the right choice with his supposed free will. Now ministers and theologians in the Netherlands at that time objected to Arminius preaching and teaching. But the civil government, largely under the influence of Olden Barnevel, would not permit a national synod that would consider Arminius' theology and condemn it. Arminius continued his series of sermons on Romans, proceeding from Romans 7 to Romans 9, the great chapter on predestination. And in preaching on Romans 9, Arminius taught 
a conditional election, and a conditional reprobation. Predestination then became the burning issue in the Reformed churches of the Netherlands at that time. Arminius taught, and pay careful attention to this, Arminius taught that predestination, particularly election, depends upon the sinner's faith, which he exercises by his free will. Predestination depends upon faith. Uh, yes, faith depends on predestination. Arminius taught predestination depends upon faith, and Reformed Orthodoxy teaches faith depends on predestination. Arminius' teaching stirred up fierce controversy throughout all of the Netherlands. The church was divided by bitter strife that extended to the ordinary, if there is such a thing, the ordinary Reformed believer in the pew. One Reformed man at that time declared publicly, I would rather have my child married by a pig than by an Arminian preacher. There was actual schism or division in the church. Reformed believers refused to worship in churches that had Arminian preachers, even though they lived next door to such a church. They would travel miles on foot and by horse and buggy to attend worship services where the minister was an Orthodox Reformed man, teaching that faith depends upon predestination. The Arminians called these Reformed believers the filthy offspring of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, accusing these Reformed believers of sowing discord in the church, just as Korah, Dathan, and Abiram sow discord in the nation of Israel. Another name that these Reformed believers were called by the Arminians was mud beggars. And evidently that was the name given to them because mud splattered them as they drove their horse and buggy miles on Sunday to attend the church of a sound preacher. Political authorities fined Reformed believers heavily for not attending the church in their area. The nation itself of the Netherlands was on the verge of civil war. And then, to add to the grief and division, Arminius was appointed professor of theology to train ministers at the prestigious University of Leiden. This created a storm of opposition led by a theologian named Gomaris, a champion of orthodoxy, who himself was already a professor at the University of Leiden. Nevertheless, Arminius was appointed professor of theology in the seminary at Leiden in 1603. And there he had the strategic position that he could train and prepare men for the ministry according to his theology so that his doctrine would be carried into the churches in which these young ministers were preachers. Before his death in 1609, Arminius taught many students his heretical theology. And he did that not only publicly in the classroom, but also and especially privately. He had to be careful of his public teaching because he had colleagues who were Orthodox Reform men, but he would invite these students into his home and there privately would instruct them in his conditional theology of free will. He would also hold private meetings with ministers who were already ordained into the ministry in order to influence them in his Arminian theology. And these, by the way, are the tactics of heretics always. They operate secretly. When they are called to account, they lie about what they actually believe. 
Heresy prefers to work in the, dark, in the darkness. The truth of the gospel wants to be open and to operate and work in the light. This describes now developments in the church leading up to the Synod of Dort. I turn now with you to the doctrinal developments that paved the way for the meeting of that great synod and the adoption of its confession. In 1610, a group of some 40 Armenian ministers and theologians met in the Dutch city of Gouda to formulate their basic beliefs in opposition to what they considered the main errors of Reformed Orthodoxy or Calvinism. They met in a city, I spell it out, named G-O-U-D-A, and a way to tell the difference between a Reformed man or woman and someone who is not from the Netherlands would be to ask him or her to pronounce the word G-O-U-D-A. The Dutchman would pronounce it Gouda. Someone who is not Dutch will invariably pr pronounce it Gouda. It's something like the difference in the nation of Israel and the judgeship of Jephthah. The Ephraimites were making trouble for Jephthah the judge and those who stood with him and were attempting to disguise themselves as being allied with Judge Jephthah. Jephthah put them to the test. They had to pronounce the word Sibboleth or Shibboleth. The people who were associated with Jephthah would pronounce it Shibboleth. Those who were not with Jephthah had to pronounce it Sibboleth. And if they pronounced that word Sibboleth, they were put to death. They were distinguished as not being of his party. <coughs> Something similar to that is the difference in pronunciation of the word G-O-U-D-A. The Dutchman pronounces it Gouda from deep in his throat. That's hard for a non-Dutchman to pronounce. This, by the way. In 1610, I was saying, 40 Arminian ministers met together to formulate authoritative, official Arminian theology over against the pure doctrine of the Reformed faith. The leader in arranging that conference of Arminian theologians was that influential preacher I have mentioned before, Eitan Bogart. The main theologian at that conference was an Arminian theologian by the name of Episcopius, and he became the main Arminian spokesman at the Synod of Dort as well. Arminius himself was not part of this meeting because he had died the year before in 1609. This conference of Arminian theologians expressed the Arminian doctrines or faith in five declarations of their belief. And since the Synod of Dort later would state the reform beliefs in response to these five points of Arminian doctrine, Dort confessed the reform faith in five points that were opposed to the Arminian five points. Hence, the doctrinal decisions of Dort have come to be known as, quote, the five points of Calvinism, end quote. All churches, theologians, and Christians who embrace and confess the five points of Calvinism are indebted to the Reformed Synod of Dort, whether they know anything about this synod or not. And all who confess the five points of Calvinism ought to know something about the five Arminian articles against which the five doctrines of Dort were directed. Celebrating the 400th anniversary of the Canons of Dort, we are obligated to know the five doctrines of Arminian theology that occasioned Dort. The first opinion, as they called it, of the Arminians dealt with the decree of predestination. That, my friends, is significant. Predestination became the leading and most important doctrine in the struggle between the Reformed faith and Arminian heresy. 
The Arminian doctrine about predestination declared that election is based upon faith which God foresaw that certain people would have and based also upon foreseeing perseverance in the faith that once they expressed. They also expressed, did the Arminians in that first point of doctrine, that God reprobated some men on the basis of the consideration of antecedent unbelief and perseverance in unbelief. I'm here quoting the Arminians themselves. God reprobated or rejected some human beings, the Arminians taught, quote, on the basis of a consideration of antecedent unbelief and perseverance in unbelief, end quote. Concerning election, God's choice of some human beings to salvation, according to Arminianism, God's election is, quote, out of consideration of faith in Jesus Christ and perseverance. Not, however, apart from a consideration of faith and perseverance in the true faith as a condition prerequisite for electing, end of quote. Note well, the Arminian theology taught and still teaches today election based on faith. Faith is a condition or prerequisite of election and salvation. The second opinion or point or doctrine of Arminianism adopted by that Arminian group in 1610 dealt with the universality of the death of Christ. According to Arminianism in this second point, Christ died for all humans without exception. He paid, now I quote, the redemption of the whole human race. No one is absolutely excluded from participation in the fruits of Christ's death by an absolute and antecedent decree of God, end quote. Nevertheless, even though Christ died to pay the price of salvation for all humans without exception, some humans are lost. And the reason is that the covenant of salvation is a, quote, pact, end quote, or conditional agreement between God and sinners so that actually receiving the benefits of the death of Christ is conditioned upon the sinners believing. Note well, faith is a condition of salvation. And faith is something that every sinner is able to fulfill by his free will. Arminianism taught at the time of Dort and still teaches to this very day universal, ineffectual atonement. The death of Christ that is effectual only by the choice of the sinner. The third and fourth opinions of the Arminians were combined which explains the combining, combining of the third and fourth doctrinal decisions of the five points of Calvinism in the canons of Dort. The third and fourth heads or doctrines are combined in the synod of Dort, the canons of Dort, and that's because the Arminians combined them in the articles that they adopted at their meeting in 1610. The third and fourth opinions of the Arminians concern the depravity of the unsaved natural person and the saving grace of God. This is an especially complicated, contradictory, and for Reformed churches today, significant section of the Arminian heresy. Let me specify the elements of the Arminian teaching in the third and fourth heads of their doctrine. It begins with what seems to be a sound confession of the depravity of the unsaved sinner. The Arminians acknowledge that the unsaved sinner does not have saving faith of himself or, quote, out of the powers of his free will, end of quote. It is necessary for salvation that the sinner be regenerated, quote, 
by God in Christ through his Holy Ghost, end quote. Still, and here's the compromise of the doctrine they have just apparently confessed rightly, unregenerated sinners are able to do good things that are useful and necessary for obtaining faith and the spirit of renewal. Here is the denial of total depravity, and again the insistence that salvation depends upon the will of the sinner. Then there is the open confession that saving grace is not, quote, irresistible, end quote. The Arminians denied in this third and fourth point that grace is irresistible. The third declaration is significant with regard to a number of controversies in Reformed and Presbyterian churches today. And now I quote Arminian doctrine, follow carefully and apply to struggles that the Reformed churches have at the present time. I quote, Whomever God calls to salvation, he calls seriously. That is, with a sincere and completely unhypocritical intention and will to save. Nor do we assent to the opinion of those who hold that God calls certain ones externally whom he does not will to call internally, that is, as truly converted, end of quote. <clears throat> the Reformed faith teaches that God calls all those who hear the gospel to repent and to believe in Jesus Christ. And it adds an explanation that God calls with the intention to save only those whom he has elected, but that God calls the reprobate only externally, setting before them their duty, but that when God calls a reprobate through the preaching of the gospel, he does not call him with the intention and desire to save him. God only calls the elect with the desire and intention to save. The Arminians deny that. And there are many nominally Reformed and Presbyterian churches today who deny it also and therefore identify themselves as really Arminian even though they have the name of being Reformed or Presbyterian. The doctrine espoused by the Arminians is the doctrine of the well-meant offer of the gospel, which many Reformed churches accept as their own doctrine. And if one disagrees, he is denounced as a hyper-Calvinist. Well, he may be a hyper-Calvinist, but he's faithful to the canons of Dort, the standard of Reformed truth and orthodoxy. These articles, the third and fourth articles of Arminian theology, go on to deny a twofold purpose of God in the preaching of the gospel, hardening some and saving others. These articles of the Arminians conclude with a denial of the sovereignty of God over evils, particularly the evil of sin. The Arminians denied that God is sovereign over sin. Sin is something over which God has no control. Contrary to what the Apostle declared in Acts 4, that when wicked men performed the most wicked act in all of history, that of condemning and killing Jesus Christ, they did what God himself had ordained and what God himself accomplished through them by his own hand. Now we come to the last, the fifth point or article or doctrine of the Arminians. That concerns the matter of the preservation or perseverance of the saints. The Arminians in their statement adopted in 1610 denied perseverance as the sure effect of election. That is, in their language, I quote, 
defined by no condition of obedience, end of quote. The Arminians taught that perseverance is conditional. It depends upon the free will of the sinner and not upon the sovereign grace of God. I quote the Arminians now. True believers can fall from true faith so that finally they perish, end of quote. True believers can never be certain that they will never fall away and be damned. And it is not necessary for a believer to be certain of this. That was the teaching of the Arminians. Now I summarize the main elements of the five articles of doctrine of the Arminians. The Arminians called their doctrines their remonstrance, that is, their solemn written objection to the Reformed faith and their statement of their own opposition to the doctrines of the Heidelberg Catechism and the Belgic Confession of Faith. For that reason, the Arminians at that time were usually called not Arminians, but remonstrants. And Reformed Orthodoxy was often referred to as anti remonstrance. There was more to the remonstrant or Arminian heresy than only these five heretical opinions. The Arminians also denied justification by faith alone. They taught rather that justification was by faith and by the will and works of the sinner himself. Here free will compromises the glorious gospel truth of justification by faith alone. In addition, the remonstrants were weak on all the doctrines of the Christian faith. After the time of the Synod of Dort, many of them fell back into the Roman Catholic Church. Others of them became sheer rationalistic modernists, denying all the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith including the Godhead of Jesus Christ. Here then was the situation of the Dutch Church, the Reformed Church in the Netherlands, shortly before the Great Synod. The condition of the Reformed Church, and therefore of the Reformed faith, was gloomy, if not hopeless. Much of the Church in the Netherlands was under the control of Armenian preachers, most of the seminaries had professors who favored Arminius and who were flooding the Dutch Reformed churches with Arminian pastors. But still, a majority of the people was Calvinistic or Reformed. Some of these congregations deposed their Arminian preachers, but then the Dutch state would reinstate these preachers to take up their position in the pulpits again. What was needed was a national synod that would condemn the theology of Arminius as heretical and authoritatively confess the truth of the gospel of grace. But the civil government, under the influence of Olden Barnevelt and his supporters, would not permit the calling of a national synod. There was one man who could possibly intervene to permit the calling of a synod, and that was Prince Moritz, the Prince of the House of Orange. For a long time, however, he did nothing and gave himself to appear as neutral in the conflict. That was partly because Olden Barnevelt and his political supporters were so powerful in the state, and that was partly because Moritz himself who was no paragon of virtue or personally a warm, dedicated Calvinist, thought it to his advantage to sit on the fence. But suddenly, almost miraculously, political circumstances in the Netherlands changed radically. In various ways, Moritz's political power grew. And then his adversary, Olden Barnevelt, made a fatal mistake, in fact two of them. 
Olden Barnevelt raised a private army for himself in conflict and opposition with the army of the Dutch state, of which Moritz was the general. In addition, it became known at this time that Olden Barnevelt had made a secret treaty with the nation of Spain, which had so dreadfully persecuted the Netherlands only recently in the Eighty Years' War. And at that same time, Moritz became convinced that he should openly ally himself with the party in the Netherlands that was opposed to the Armenians. Moritz imprisoned Olden Barnevelt as a traitor against the Dutch nation, especially for making that treaty with Roman Catholic Spain. Moritz then became firmly in control of the Dutch civil government, and he saw to it that the Dutch state allowed the calling of a national synod. He wanted to put an end to the division in the Netherlands, and he wanted to unify the Reformed Church. In this way, God preserved his church, and God gave a grand creed to Reformed churches worldwide to the present day in the calling of the Synod of Dort. And to this creed we will turn in the next lecture, God willing. <laughs>